The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Morris Animal Foundation webinar, Mast Cell Tumors of Dogs and Cats. Today, we hope you will learn more about this common, yet potentially dangerous skin tumor. We will give you tools to help properly identify mast cell tumors, and we will explain which treatment options are currently available. Last, we will discuss Morris Animal Foundation funded research on mast cell tumors and ways that you can get involved to make a difference and put an end to pet cancer. My name is Liz Naon and I am the Donor Relations Specialist at Morris Animal Foundation. I will be introducing you to today's webinar and our presenter, Dr. Kelly Deal. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to review. To eliminate the background noise, you will be placed on mute. If you have a question at any time, please use the chat feature located on your screen. At the end of Dr. Deal's presentation, we will have time to answer a few of your questions. Any questions that can't be addressed today will be answered by email within the next week. Next, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Morris Animal Foundation and how the science we invest in improves the lives of the animals we all love. Then, Dr. Deal will educate everyone about mast cell tumors, followed by a short question and answer segment. Founded by Dr. Mark L. Morris Sr. in 1948, Morris Animal Foundation is a nonprofit organization that invests in powerful science to advance veterinary medicine for companion animals, horses, and wildlife. The foundation's humble beginning took place in Dr. Morris's very own kitchen, where he developed what would later become the first Hills Pet Nutrition Prescription Diet. Dr. Morris became a leader in pet nutrition, and he used those royalties from his prescription diets to establish Morris Animal Foundation. Today, Morris Animal Foundation is a global leader in veterinary health and funds more research for more species in more places than any other organization in the world. Throughout our history, we've invested more than $70 million towards more than 2,000 studies. At this time, Morris Animal Foundation is funding nearly 240 animal health studies that were rigorously reviewed by a volunteer scientific advisory board to determine which studies had greatest merit and potential benefit. Ultimately, Morris Animal Foundation depends upon the generosity of our donors, and we simply could not do what we do without your support. The topic of today's webinar is mast cell tumors, which are common yet potentially harmful skin tumors that we can see in our pets. Morris Animal Foundation believes that every pet deserves a long, healthy life. Unfortunately, because of diseases such as mast cell tumors, this isn't always the reality. In fact, a fact that you may find surprising is that cancer ends the lives of more dogs and cats than any other disease. Furthermore, just like in humans, the cause of cancer in pets remains relatively unknown. Overall, there is simply not enough research around pet cancer, and that is why Morris Animal Foundation is taking a stand and uniting to fight pet cancer. We believe that by coming together and fighting back against pet cancer, our collective power can really make the difference. Later on, I will happily tell you about how you can get involved and make a difference, but first, I am pleased to introduce you to Dr. Kelly Deal, today's webinar presenter. Upon receiving her DVM from the University of Tennessee, Dr. Deal completed an internship at the Animal Medical Center in New York, and then a residency in small animal medicine at Colorado State University. After completing a three-year NIH postdoctoral fellowship at National Jewish Health, Dr. Deal joined the staff of the Veterinary Referral Center of Colorado as the co-owner of the internal medicine section. After 14 years, Dr. Deal left private practice to pursue a career in medical communication. She joined the Morris Animal Foundation team, and we are happy she did, last fall as a foundation-funded researcher. Dr. Deal lives in Colorado with her husband, two children, two cats, and one very lovable Labrador Retriever. Dr. Deal, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Liz. So I wanted to first start with a brief overview of what we'll discuss today. 
First, I wanted to let you know that there is a handout available at our website, www.morrisonwellfoundation.org. And you can either follow along with the handout or it's, it will be available after the webinar if you need to refer back to any of the material that I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to start our webinar with a definition of what is cancer. And I think all of us have a really distinct idea or thought about cancer, but I'm going to steer us a little bit more towards a medical definition of cancer. And this will help with understanding the topic of mast cell tumors as we discuss it, and also give us a little insight into some of the preventative and treatment strategies. Then we're going to talk about mast cells. What are these little bizarre cells that we all have normally in our bodies? Then we'll move on to what are mast cell tumors. We'll finish up with diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, and furthermore end with a little discussion of what we're doing here at Morse Animal Foundation to address mast cell tumors in our pets. So, First of all, we'll talk about what is cancer. And if I pause a little bit, what I'm doing is watching as most of you catch up with me. I'm a little faster on getting my graphics than you are. So Matt, cancer is a genetic disease, but not a genetic disease like most people think. It's a disease where the cells of the body and the genetic material contained within those cells suddenly becomes abnormal. It doesn't respond to normal signals, and it has to do with the replication or duplication of cells in an inappropriate way. We know there's inherited predisposition towards developing cancer, and we know that certain breeds of dogs are predisposed to certain types of cancers, and we certainly see how cancer can run in different human families. Another way to think about cancer is that it represents a return to more immature type cells. And what I mean by that is think of us as we're developing as babies and kids. We have cells that are rapidly dividing and changing and we're growing, but we don't keep growing through our whole lifetime. The cells respond to signals that tell them to stop. But cancer really represents cells that have gone back to a more immature type of behavior. The environment also, just like in people, is an important but not sole cause of cancer. So again, it can be very influential, and an obvious example is smoking as it relates to lung cancer in people. But what we know about the environment is that it can be important when you put a genetically predisposed person or animal in that situation, and then the collision of these two factors can lead to the development of cancer. So again, I'm going to wait for you guys to catch up a little bit because we have a lovely graphic here that I want to share with you. So I'm going to go over now six characteristics of cancer. And this list which is developed by some human oncologists and pathologists to describe kind of the overall characteristics of a cancer. And it holds for all cancers. Some of these will overlap, but we'll go through them anyway. So first and obvious, these cells ex exhibit sustained growth. And I told you before, we don't keep growing for our entire lifetime, but cancer cells just keep growing and growing and growing much longer than a normal type of cell. These cells, in addition, don't respond to the normal anti-growth signals that are sent out by other cells of the body. So they just keep going and going. Those signals are there, but they don't respond to them. Cancer cells also live longer than other cells in the body. They're very resistant to death signals that all of our cells get. So number four, these cells limitlessly replicate or duplicate. And an interesting fact that you may not know is that the cells in our body actually are programmed to divide a few times and then stop. And all the different cells in our body have different abilities to divide, but they ultimately stop. 
cancer cells, again, are very unusual in that they seem to just keep going and going and going, like the Energizer Bunny. They just keep replicating and replicating for reasons which were, are not completely clear to us. Number five is probably an unusual characteristic of cancer, but a very important one to know because a lot of treatment strategies are directed at this particular characteristic, and that is cancer cells are very good at recruiting blood vessels to them. So why would that be important? Well, think about your body. We all depend on our circulatory system or our blood vessels to bring us nutrients or oxygen to supply our cells, to just do their, their jobs. Well, cancer cells, in order to grow, they need to tap into that very same system. And their cells are very good at persuading, and that's a funny word, but I'm going to say it, persuading blood vessels to kind of tap into the tumor. That way, they can then compete with the other cells of our body for all those nutrients we need. And if you think about a person you know who's had cancer or a pet, they often become very thin, they lose weight. Well, that's because the cancer is now competing with them for the nutrients that the body has. Finally, and again, quite obviously, these cells are really good at invading other tissues and spread. Our cells in our body normally, they'll start dividing, they bump up against another cell, and they'll often stop. They don't keep growing, they don't grow over each other. Think about it. You don't see normal liver cells in your lungs. They just don't go there. Your muscle cells don't end up in your brain. They stay where they're supposed to be. Well, cancer cells, for, again, reasons that are not entirely clear, they don't listen to those signals, and they will spread to distant places. So now to continue on, and I'm waiting for some of you to catch up, and it's because I have a beautiful, fancy picture here of mast cells in our lower right corner, and I'll talk about them in a minute. So what are mast cells? Well, mast cells are a type of white blood cells. So they're just a normal part of our body. They tend to be concentrated in areas close to the external environment. We'll talk a little more about that. So skin and your airways in particular. And they have granules that are filled with different chemicals that contribute to their very typical appearance. So I'm going to guide you through this lower right-hand picture. You'll see some arrows, and they're pointing at mast cells, and the top arrow is pointing at the little granules. So this is a collection of mast cells. They're these beautiful, purpley, big cells with lots of little, tiny, purple-staining granules in them. They're quite distinct and very unique in their appearance. So on the right, again, a collection of mast cells. And I'll show you some more pictures as we go through our webinar. So what do mast cells do in animals? And this would be pretty much the same thing they do in people. They help protect against infections. We said, again, they are part of our white blood cell system. They are particularly important in the fight against bacteria. Parasites is a, a, a type of invader that they're very effective against. Fungal infections. And they're important in allergic reactions, both good and bad. So let's talk a little bit more about them. So again, I'm waiting for you guys to catch up. There we go. As we, again, have a beautiful picture in the bottom right-hand screen of a lot of mast cells. So you can see they can vary in size a little bit, lots of granules, very obvious looking. So mast cell granules release chemicals when they're stimulated. And these chemicals are in their granules. Mast cells get stimulated maybe by an invading parasite. Again, remember we said they tend to be skin and airways. That's where we come in contact with a lot of pathogens. And a pathogen is something like a virus or bacteria. And what they release are one thing is heparin. And heparin is an anticoagulant. If you've ever been in the hospital and had an IV line, they'll often flush your IV line with a heparin solution. That's to keep the IV line open and keep the blood from clotting. They also produce histamine, and you guys probably are queuing right into that. We said they're important in allergic reactions. Well, these are the guys that cause you to have hay fever and anaphylactic reactions. They release histamine, hence the reason we take antihistamine. They release chemicals that cause inflammation. 
And you might be thinking, well, this all sounds kind of nasty. Why would this be, you know, why are these guys beneficial? Well, just like inflammation is uncomfortable to us, right? You get redness, you might get swelling, you get heat in an area. Well, that same, those same substances that are irritating to us are also very irritating to potential invaders like bacteria or parasites. So the mast cells, when they degranulate, are trying to make the environment pretty uncomfortable for these pathogens. Mast cells also have enzymes in them. And think of enzymes as substances that, think of your digestive enzymes. They digest things. So these enzymes are present also to make the environment very uncomfortable for any invaders and potentially destroy them. So sorry, I'm waiting for you guys to catch up because I have an interesting picture here. So here we go. So what are mast cell tumors? So we'll jump to the chase here. So mast cell tumors are a collection of mast cells. Normally, mast cells may be in your airways or in the skin, but they don't tend to be kind of clumped up or clumped together. Mast cell tumors are the most common type of skin tumor of dogs. And I'm going to take a little sidestep off the path here because if you've ever had an older dog, I bet a lot of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. I had this old dog, and they were just loaded with these things that my vet said were fatty tumors. How can the mast cell tumor be the most common skin tumor? Well, I have to put on my pathologist hat here and say that when we talk about a skin tumor, we're talking about the very upper layers of the skin. Lower layers are where the fat cells are located, and that's where these fatty tumors arise. And again, they can look very similar, and I'll make that point later, but from a standpoint of when you think of the anatomy of the dog, these tumors are, tend to be higher up in the skin, and fatty tumors tend to be a little bit deeper. Mast cell tumors, interestingly, are the second most common type of skin tumor in cats, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between differences between dog and cat mast cell tumors later in the webinar. So again, I'm going to wait for you guys to catch up with me, and we'll talk about who gets mast cell tumors. Well, number one, bulldogs and their descendants. We've got a very handsome bulldog down here in our lower left corner. So bulldogs and their descendants being Boston's uh, boxers, French Bulldogs, all those dogs with the kind of the smushy faces. Um, our friends, Labradors Retrievers and Golden Retrievers, again, we know that they are breeds that tend to get a lot of cancers, particularly Goldens. They are also kind of high on the list of the types of breeds that get mast cell tumors. Beagles, which is kind of an interesting um, tumor for them. Rhodesian Ridgebacks, it's not up here, but Weimariners are a breed that are predisposed. Sharpays are predisposed, and for cats, it's Siamese cats. However, the point I really want to hammer home to you guys is that any dog or cat can get this tumor. They can be mixed breed dogs, mixed breed cats, which is really the most common type of cat that most people have in their house. So again, I don't want to lull you into a sense of security that just because you don't have one of these breeds or you have a, a mutt that your dog or cat is immune to getting this type of tumor. So again, I'm going to wait for you guys to catch up a bit. A lot of this has to do with all the photographs that I have for you to look at. So how can you tell if your pet has a mast cell tumor? And I'm going to try to show you throughout this webinar different pictures of mast cell tumors and what they can look like. So Mast cell tumors are often red in color, and this upper left picture where you see that red bump, that's a very classic looking mast cell tumor. Again, the reason they're red in color is think about those granules in the mast cells. They're releasing them even though they're a tumor, and so they can be cause some very local irritation. They are sometimes ulcerated and irritated, and part of that, again, is because of the, the type of substances that are contained in the granules, and sometimes because these things get itchy, they're irritating, a dog or cat may scratch at them or bite at them or rub at them, but they can look like just about anything. So this bottom picture is the top of a dog's front leg, down by the toes there, and that red area is a mast cell tumor. 
very interesting on this upper right picture where you see the person's hand, they're actually showing you a teat or mammary gland in a dog that has developed a mast cell tumor. And you might just look at that and say, oh, my dog's got a little growth here on its mammary gland. But that was actually turned out to be a mast cell tumor. So where do mast cell tumors develop? In the dog, they tend to occur most commonly, though not always, on the trunk and limbs. In cats, the opposite direction. Most of them occur on the head and neck. And on the lower right-hand side, you'll see a picture of a cat with the arrow pointing to a mast cell tumor, which could even look like a scratch or an abscess or a cat bite or cat bite. Um, occasionally, we also see mast cell tumors develop in internal organs or in the bloodstream. And I'll talk a little bit about those forms as we get further along in the webinar. So again, I'm waiting for you guys to catch up with me, but how are mast cell tumors diagnosed? Well, one of the good things about mast cells, as I alluded to before, is they have a very distinctive appearance. And sometimes these are one of the easier types of tumors to diagnose even during a routine examination with your family veterinarian. First way that we would try to diagnose a tumor would be with a needle aspirate. And this is where you take a tiny needle and you kind of poke it, and I know that sounds nasty, but it's not, uh, into a tumor, and you go pop, 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 and then you attach it a syringe, blow out the contents onto a slide, stain it, and then look at it under the microscope. And again, mast cells have a very particular appearance, so you can often diagnose these pretty quickly in the exam room. Of course, the other way mast cell tumors are diagnosed is via biopsy. And that can take a variety of forms from what's called an excisional biopsy, where maybe you would take a, the whole lump out, the patient's under anesthesia, and you take out the lump and send the whole mass in for examination, or maybe, such as the, the case for this little white dog, that if you notice that dog's left rear leg is quite swollen, that's all mast cell tumor. Well, that would be pretty hard to diagnose, or you obviously can't take that all out. So you might do a little biopsy. Again, some of these, most of these are done with some anesthesia, and uh, some are done under a local anesthetic, and a small wedge or little punch biopsy is taken and submitted to a pathologist for them to tell us what kind of tumor is present. So this is another common way that mast cell tumors are diagnosed. There's no real good blood test, to be honest with you, that would tell you whether you have a mast cell tumor unless you have the type of mast cell disease where there are more mast cells in your bloodstream than we would normally expect. So I'm also going to deviate off the path here a little bit to talk about how mast cell tumors are graded, and this applies to the dog. Many years ago, a grading system was established for mast cell tumors, which is still kind of a very, very commonly used scheme. And if you've ever had a dog with a mast cell tumor, you have almost assuredly heard what type of grade tumor they had. And it goes grades 1, 2, and 3, with 1 being the most benign in behavior, and grade 3 being the most aggressive. And this picture on the lower right side shows a very small, this is on the inside aspect of a dog's ear, so the inside of the ear, a little tiny mast cell tumor. So what do we know about grade 1 mast cell tumors? Well, they tend to be also called low-grade tumors. They are the most common type, though there's some question because grade 2 tumors can encompass a lot of different types of tumors as well. They are characterized by a lack of rapid cell division, which means these things don't grow very fast. They don't tend to spread at all. And when you aspirate them, they have lots of well-defined granules, so they're very easy to diagnose. And on the lower right side here, I have a picture provided by Dr. Elizabeth McNeil at Tufts University. Dr. McNeil is a Morris Animal Foundation funded researcher, and a lot of her research focuses on mast cell tumors. And here she is showing on her very own Boston Terrier on his lower lip a little tiny grade one mast cell tumor. So this guy got lucky because his mom it happens to be a mast cell tumor 
veterinary oncologist, researcher, and she was able to treat this very easily, but she sent it to me as an example of a grade 1 mast cell tumor. So what about grade 2 mast cell tumors? Well, as you can imagine, these are slightly more aggressive tumors, and grade 2 is a pretty big uh, uh, catch-all for these intermediate grade tumors. When a pathologist looks at these, they'll see more cells that are actively dividing. So a little bit more aggressive, a little bit growing perhaps a little faster, maybe starting to get a little invasive. The granules are present but less distinct, and this makes these guys a little bit harder to diagnose sometimes, but um, it's because the cells are rapidly dividing. And on the your lower right hand, there's a picture of a mast cell tumor, and this is at the angle of the left side of the jaw of a boxer dog. So again, one of the breeds we said predisposed, a bulldog descendant. And you may get the idea that there's a little ulcerated area there, but again, this would be kind of a peculiar looking growth. It would be easy to overlook and not quite typical for a mast cell. We got the right breed, but not the right location, again, on the head of a dog. So again, I'm going to wait for you guys to catch up with me a bit. Here we go. And I'm going to talk about grade 3 mast cell tumors. These are really bad guys. And they're high-grade tumors. There are lots of cells that are rapidly dividing. They have sparse granules, so these guys are very difficult to diagnose, sometimes in the exam room. And on your lower right hand of your screen, this picture, if you're just to orient you, the dog's head is to your left, the tail is to the right, and this dog is lying on its back. Where you're seeing the arrows pointing, you can see all these sort of red plaques. They're not raised. They're very flat looking, but they're everywhere. This is actually a grade 3 mast cell tumor. And again, this thing is spreading on this dog's abdomen. You can imagine this would be very difficult, if not impossible, to treat surgically. And there's a good likelihood that this is spreading elsewhere. So this is an example of a grade 3. Some of these can get very, very ulcerated and red looking. They almost look like um, like a road rash or road burn, uh, and they can come up very quickly. So let's talk quickly about mast cell tumors in cats. Cats being the unusual species that they are, they People have tried to apply the dog grading system to their tumors, and it just doesn't work. So the way we grade cat mast cell tumors or classify them is basically on in three types based on where they are. And that is the skin, which is the most common area. And remember, this is the most common type of skin tumor in cats. The spleen and the intestine. And here on the right side, you see a kitty with um, that's actually under anesthesia to have this mast cell tumor removed from the corner of its eye. Which brings us to this next point, which is, okay, I'm sure you guys are all wondering, how are mast cell tumors treated? And you probably get the idea from what I've said before, that surgery is always the best option if possible. So, uh, and it can be curative, especially in the case of a grade 1 mast cell tumor. Sometimes because of where these things are located, or because of how extensive they are, or if they're invasive, surgery alone doesn't get the tumor. And so we might combine surgery with either radiation or surgery and chemotherapy. And again, I'm going to deviate off the path just slightly. When we remove a tumor, one thing that a pathologist, which is the person at the laboratory who's going to look at these tumors under the microscope, they're going to make a call on what type of tumor it is, but they're going to pay attention to what's called the margin, which is the edge of the tumor. Are there cells there? Sometimes you know you didn't get all the tumor, and you know that the margin is going to be what's called dirty. There are going to be tumor cells right up to the margin. But sometimes when you remove a mass, you think, maybe I did get it all. And the pathologist is going to pay a lot of attention to this margin. And if they see tumor cells up to the margin, that may require further treatment with either radiation or chemotherapy to make sure that if there's any residual disease, you're addressing it. And that's what happened with this dog on the right-hand side. And again, you can see we're talking about the top of the foot of a dog, and that's a pretty big mast cell tumor. Luckily for this dog, it was a grade 2, even though it does look nasty, but it's in a terrible place. And what these clinicians did is they debulked the tumor, they took what they could, 
And then they followed up, in this case, with chemotherapy. And the bottom picture is two or three months after the first picture was taken, when this dog has had debulking surgery and follow-up chemotherapy, and things are looking pretty good at that point. So what is the prognosis for these kinds of tumors? Well, as you might imagine, a lot depends on tumor grade, which is the most reliable prognostic factor, obviously, in the dog. Uh, location, again, this is important in the cat, but likewise in the dog. If you have a, a grade 1 tumor, but it's in a very difficult place to remove, then it, prognosis might be a little poor for it. The same for a grade 2 tumor. It might be a slightly more aggressive tumor, but if it's in a place where it's very easy to remove, again, the prognosis might be on the better side for that. Another prognostic factor is the stage. And if you have known someone with cancer or you've had a pet with cancer, you know people talk about staging. And what staging is is a fancy term that's looking for spread and signs of spread. I'll use the breast cancer example again. What we know in women is if you have breast cancer, they're going to pay a lot of attention to your lymph nodes. And they're going to see, is there any chance that this tumor in cancer is in the local lymph nodes? We'll do the same in dogs and cats. Another thing is we're going to look for signs of spread in other areas. And a very common place for spread or metastases to occur is the lungs. So we'll take a chest x-ray. In people, they'll sometimes actually do a CT scan to look to see, is there any sign of spread? Obviously, the prognosis is going to be worse. Even if the tumor on the skin looks very benign or you think you can get it, there's signs of spread that makes the prognosis worse. Finally, are these pets sick? This is especially important if we believe that the tumor is spreading or might be in an internal organ because that makes the prognosis much worse. And we'll talk about that with, is particularly with cats. So what is the prognosis for dogs? Well, I gave some average survival times here, and some of these are a little mushy. And what I mean by mushy is if you read different studies, they may have little differ, different survival times, but I tried to average them out. And for grade ones, they talk about an 80 to 90 percent survival long term. And what they're talking about long term is they're talking about years and years. So again, some of these dogs are completely cured. Now that doesn't mean they can't develop a mast cell tumor someplace else. And that doesn't get factored into survival times. But they're talking about the survival time of a particular tumor that's been treated. Grade 2, also not bad. 75% survive long term. And remember, grade 2 is a pretty big category. And it extends from very benign looking, almost grade 1 tumors to very aggressive, almost grade 3 tumors. So that's why the survival time is a little bit long, shorter. But again, very good. And some of these dogs can live for years. Grade 3, absolutely terrible prognosis. Most dogs, and I'm probably being generous here, but some studies suggest that they can live up to about one year. But most studies show that these dogs succumb even with treatment within two or three months of diagnosis. So the prognosis for cats also depends actually most heavily on the location. So skin tumors, very good. Again, many of these cats can be cured or live for very long years after they have a tumor removed. Interestingly, you think for spleen tumors that would be a terrible prognosis. And um, a lot of spleen tumors in cats, there's evidence that the cells have spread. However, if you take the spleen out of cats, they can live for a couple years after their spleen is removed, which is interesting for cats and a little unusual, but good news for them. However, cats also have a terrible prognosis if you find a mast cell tumor in their intestine. Even with removal, these cats at best live a few months. So now I'm waiting for a few of you to catch up with me, OK? And we're going to talk a little bit about what more Animal Foundation, what we're doing here to try to address mast cell tumor disease. And this is a really hot area of research right now. And in the last 10 years alone, 
we have funded four scientist training grants, and these are awarded to individuals who are really up-and-coming researchers in veterinary science. And, of, and these four training grants were given to people who were looking at mast cell tumor behavior. So in total, we've awarded $750,000 in the last 10 years for mast cell tumor research. So again, I'm waiting for a few of you to, to catch up, but I just wanted to tell you, of the remaining seven studies, so we have 11 studies funded, four were training grants, and seven were other studies, and I tried to break them up into categories that would be easy for us to discuss. Four of our studies are looking at predictors of tumor behavior. And what these researchers are looking at is very, very precise and focused research at the mast cell tumors themselves. And is there something that we can find in these tumors that will predict tumor behavior? Again, the earlier that we can do this, the more accurately we can do this, really may have an impact on longevity for these patients, particularly if we need to be aggressive in some of our treatment protocols. We have one study that's looking at identifying dogs at risk, and what they're looking for is genetic markers that could be tested early in a dog's life or identifying dogs that would be at a higher risk for developing mast cell tumors. And again, to use a human analogy, there are a lot of genes identified for breast cancer risk, and if you think of Angelina Jolie and Christina Applegate, they were women who had this genetic predisposition. It was a test. There's a gene that the people can identify, and that way these patients can be looked at and carefully monitored. Well, we have one study looking very closely at dogs to try to find a basically a diagnostic test to identify these dogs way before they ever develop a mast cell tumor. Finally, we have two studies that are looking at potential treatment targets. And what these studies are doing is, if you know anything about chemotherapy in people, and the same goes for animals, a lot of times we're giving very toxic drugs or we're irradiating big areas. And as you know, there can be a lot of collateral damage. You're hitting not only just the, the cancer cells, but you're affecting a lot of normal cells. And what two of our researchers are doing is looking very precisely at how mast cell tumors behave to see is there something about them that's unique that we can target treatment to so we don't have these devastating side effects that can inhibit our ability, frankly, to give treatment to our dogs and cat patients. So finally, my last slide, I wanted to touch on a really landmark study that we're doing here at Morris Animal Foundation, and it's the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. And what this study is doing is enrolling young Golden Retrievers to under two years of age and following them for their entire life. And what these participants, owners and dogs, do is they get routine physical examinations and blood work done, and the owners have to fill out this very extensive questionnaire about diet, exercise, environment, I mean, just everything. And the goal is to try to look for risk factors for diseases which include cancer. And if you remember back to one of our earlier slides, and if certainly if you've owned a Golden Retriever, you know that they have a high incidence of cancer, including mast cell tumors. So our hope is that we will also glean some more information about mast cell tumors from this very large longitudinal study. And ultimately, we're hoping that this study will improve the health, not just for future golden generations of golden retrievers, but for dogs in general. So thanks, and I'm going to give you back to Liz, where she's going to talk a little bit more about some of Morris's other initiatives against cancer. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Deal. Um, that's a really informative and engaging presentation. And um, I know a lot of you out there listening, this is a very um, important and applicable topic. So I hope you guys have been able to gather some helpful information about mast cell tumors. Before we um, get to answer some viewer questions, I want to thank our supporters 
have made research into mast cell tumors and other cancers possible. We at Morris Animal Foundation love what we do, but none of our work would be possible without you. So thank you for all that you do. Just like you, we know that animals enrich and bring greater meaning to our lives. However, nearly 6 million new cat cancer diagnoses are made each year, and cancer is one of the leading causes of death in, do in, excuse me, in dogs. To help fight this disease, Morris Animal Foundation launched Unite to Fight Pet Cancer to create awareness of the devastating effects of pet cancer and to highlight the urgency for increased funding for pet cancer research. The great news is that there are many ways that you can get involved and make a positive impact. One way that you can take a stand against pet cancer is to participate in our Unite to Fight Virtual Pet Cancer Walk on June 22nd. On this date, participants around the world will pledge to take their pets for a walk in honor of dogs and cats that have fought cancer. This is a really unique way of getting involved because you can do this from anywhere in the world and still make a difference. Another way to take a stand against pet cancer is to download the Morris Animal Foundation Pet Cancer Information Kit, which is available at that link shown at the bottom of the screen. This free kit contains helpful tools, such as the top warning signs of cancer in dogs and cats, as well as a resource to help you and your veterinarian better monitor your pet's health. One more way to stay ahead of pet cancer is to attend our upcoming free webinar on Wednesday, August 20th, during which we will speak about lymphoma, a cancer of the immune system. This is another common cancer that affects companion and large animals, and we will discuss just how Morris Animal Foundation is investing in science to bring an end to this disease. Guys, there are so many ways to fight back against pet cancer, and Morris Animal Foundation is just beyond thankful for all of your support and support of our donors um, who are all uniting to fight pet cancer. So thank you so much to everyone out there. We have a couple moments here to just answer a few of our viewer questions. Any, again, that we do not get to at this moment, we will um, reply to you within the next week here. So, Dr. Deal, the first question comes from Dave. And he wants to know, what should I do if I suspect my pet has a mast cell tumor? So um, this is a good question because, you know, whenever we talk about a disease, it always, you always worry, oh my gosh, you know, does my pet have this? And one thing is, if you get, ever see a new lump or bump on a pet that doesn't go away or is easily, you know, easily explained, then you should ha take them to your veterinarian and have at least the mass looked at. We talked about needle aspirate, so sometimes that's a good way of assessing these. And what a lot of vets will do and, and what you can do even at home is to kind of keep track of the lumps and bumps that pop up on your pet. Make sure that they're checked and watch them. If they suddenly start to change in configuration, they become painful, they become large very quickly, then those lumps and bumps need to be checked out. Perfect. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. So always good to go to your vet just to get any confirmation. Um, we've got another question. It comes from Rick, and he asks, are there any known diet or environmental triggers for mast cell tumors? Oh, wow. This is, that's a good question. Um, unlike some of the other cancers in pets, the, the short answer is no. We don't know of anything specific. Now, some people have speculated that in pets that have a history of allergies, and think of allergies and mast cells and being reactive, that they may have a slight higher incidence of mast cell tumors, but that really hasn't been shown. It may be simply that the same guys that get mast cell tumors also tend to be our allergic dogs like Labradors and Golden Retrievers. Perfect. I really appreciate you answering just a couple of questions. I wish we had more time to go through more, but we will be sure to get to the rest of your questions at a later date and get those answered to all of you out there. That is all the questions we have time for today. If you wish to review or share this webinar, we will make it available along with an accompanying handout available on our Morris Animal Foundation website later this week. We know, um, that the, again, that there were a lot of great questions out there, and Dr. Deal has graciously agreed to answer 
all of your outstanding questions that appear in the chat bar, and we will get those emailed to you within the next week. Thank you again, Dr. Deal, for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Liz. Um, thank you all out there for joining us today. Before you do sign off, um, I know it's just another minute of your time, but there are four very short um, survey questions that help us here um, pick which topics to choose for our upcoming webinars. Let us know what um, maybe we could have done better today to make this a more um, educational, enjoyable experience. So please, if you have literally 60 seconds, go ahead, take those short, quick survey questions. We really appreciate it. But most of all, we appreciate you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.